Thank you everyone for being part of this uh, our panel. This actually feels intimate, even if it's, it's online. Uh, yeah, I just want to quickly say that I'm so excited to have everyone here. And uh, one of the things that really gave me hope when I moved to the US, uh, realizing all the racial disparities that were very shocking to me, because that's not something that you know if you didn't grow up in the US, was working with entrepreneurs, because we think in terms of solution and I like to solve problems. So seeing the entrepreneurs of color always gave me hope that we could actually uh, make this country more inclusive. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to just introduce uh, our uh, panelists. Um, and in order of, uh, uh, or let them introduce themselves uh, using these two questions. So we're gonna have two questions, two, two minutes, each person. So we're going to make sure that everyone is giving uh, others the time to intervene. So I'm going to start with, uh, with Amber. Uh, if you, Amber, if you could tell us uh, who you were, what you do, why you do what you do. And also, if you don't mind, tell us your story. Why, why Rhode Island? Were you born in Rhode Island? Uh, why did you choose to do business in Rhode Island? Hi everyone, I'm Amber Jackson, the owner of the Black Leaf Tea and Culture Shop. So I am from Chicago. I moved to Rhode Island November of 2017 uh, for work. So I work full-time at Brown University in athletics. I'm their team travel manager and financial coordinator. So I manage all 38 of our teams on my own. Uh, and when I moved here, I quickly noticed the lack of diversity. I had an idea before I moved here. And then when I moved here, I was like, oh, it's, it's really, really white. Uh, so uh, when I moved here, my coworkers to take me out and just being nice, uh, I quickly noticed that almost every time we went out, I was the only black person in every room I went into. And it's an extremely uncomfortable feeling. And so I wanted to create a space and curate conversations for people that look like me that don't have a space while also incorporating my love for tea, loose leaf teas. And so academically, my background is in nutrition and uh, food science. Um, and so to incorporate all that together to really create this uh, community for young black professionals within the Rhode Island community because we have a lot of transplants like myself that come to work at Brown or other corporations or other institutions that don't have a space that, that they felt welcome to be in. And so I uh, formulate and design my own loose leaf tea blends. I host uh, community and cultural events such as a monthly, well before Corona, I did a monthly young black professionals mixer and hosted conversations called Tea Talks, which were roundtable conversations that um, everything from current events, pop culture, Black community, uh, dating, sex relationships, anything that affected the Black community. And why Rhode Island? Why did you choose to build your business in Rhode Island? I, I was just here, to be honest. Like, I, was, I was here. Um, and so I, it was, it was where I saw a need. And so I saw where I could fit myself into that to uh, fulfill that need. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've, I had the pleasure to work with, uh, with Amber and I have to say her teas are fantastic. They're delicious. I bought Sam. You should also get Sam. I guess I can advertise because I don't work for venture capital. There's no conflict of interest here, right? <laughs> But yeah, uh, so thank you so much, Amber. So on on order of my screen, the next person is Sterling. That's good, because that we're starting with women. So if, Star if you could also answer those questions for us, uh, for the people who are following us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sterling Clinton Spellman. I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I own Polished by Sterling, which is a coaching and consulting company. I also am the co-owner of the incredible food truck. My husband and I own two food trucks in Rhode Island. Make sure you check us out. And I am the founder of the Polished Gems program. All of my work outside of the food truck is geared around women and girls of color, empowering them and Everything personal development. Now, why is personal development important? If you are a business owner on here, you know that um, personal development is going, if you don't work on that, 
is going to make or break you in business. And so I decided to um, create a business around personal development because that's what really helped me grow. And I noticed a major gap here in Rhode Island. Every conference or event I would go to that was about business or about developing yourself, I would be the only Black person in the room. Um, I remember four years ago, um, I went to a conference, a big conference here for women, over a thousand women, and I looked around in the room and I can count how many women of color were in the room. And why does that matter? It matters because our experiences are different. Even though we have some things that are the same, our experience is different and representation matters. So I said, why not create a space where women of color can come and learn about business, learn about personal development and grow. So for the past three years, I put on a conference for women of color um, where I brought in speakers from all across the country and the world to come and teach them and, um, and show them that yes, you black woman brown woman can be successful in business even though you don't see it right here in your face in the state so that's why rhode island i was born and raised here um i went away to new york to college and then i dragged my husband back here <laughs> and i've been here but i always as a young person i always was very active in my community and wanted to make sure that people knew that we could do it too so that's why rhode island thank you so much sterling uh yeah, what a fantastic woman. Uh, hi. So now I would like to hear from uh, Caroline Jean-Baptiste. Great, can you hear me? And see me great, because I was going through a lot of technical difficulties <laughs> this morning. But hi, my name is Caroline. I'm the founder of Curly Girl. We're a natural hair care venture, and we cater to folks with coilier textures with our plant-based and organic products. We've been in the market since um, 2018. In 2018, um, we've been really dedicated to serving um, women of color, especially women of color that are underrepresented in the hair and beauty space. So dark skinned women, fat femmes, as well as queer and trans non-binary folks of color. So why um, Rhode Island? Well, I guess my why stems from um, well, because I graduated from Brown. So that's my, my why Rhode Island actually starts with Brown University. I graduated in 2016 with a degree in political science and Africana studies. Um, I spent a majority of my time really dedicated to learning more about black women and the diaspora. And yeah, so in a lot of ways, Rhode Island has been the home of my adulthood and growing my venture was just a natural ex extension of me growing into myself as a young professional and as a woman. Great, thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Go um, ahead. My name is Juan Wilson, uh, J. Juan the Brand, born and raised here in Providence, Rhode Island. Well, I don't reside in Providence, Rhode Island now, but, um, but I still live in Rhode Island, uh, born on the east side. Um, I'm a business consultant and a serial entrepreneur. Um, most of my businesses are what we call non-gravity, they're digital. I focus on intellectual property. So I have a record label uh, with a joint venture well, with an artist that signed with Atlantic Records. Uh, I also work with a local corporation called In Music and one of their brands is Akai. And so I develop uh, with my producers sound kits that we sell digital. So most of my products are digital and global. Um, but as far as local and something that's brick and mortar and in the community, uh, I work closely with the youth. Uh, for the past five years, we've hosted, uh, I'm a co-founder of a uh, youth summit called Yes QBD, formerly Turn Up Our Ride. Um, Co-founders with Kobe Dennis, Andy Ann Kuma, and Dr. Tayano Palermo. Um, so me being on this panel is basically talking, being proactive and talking about the youth moving forward. Um, and, and these underserved communities and youth of color uh, and using my skill sets and, and what I've learned over the years to teach them. And why Rhode Island? Like I said, I'm born and, and raised here. It's a, little, it's a little different because Zoom and Skype and WhatsApp's been my life for, I can say, well over eight years. It just hasn't been my life with my entire family, from my wife to my daughter to my friends, my colleagues. I'm like, this is, this is taking getting some used to over the past four months. Um, but I do do this often, and um, yeah, 
I'm happy to be here and, and Avi, Amy, and Tuni, we haven't met in person, uh, but the staff you have is great. Um, innovation, if you look behind me, this is your neighboring bridge, which is gonna be named after my cousin, Michael S. Van Leeston. Uh, who was my mentor and um, passed last summer, and we're actually renaming it to the Michael S. Van Leeson Pedestrian Bridge, thanks to City Hall and the council. Um, United, United States approved it. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm definitely, I definitely love CIC and I definitely love Venture Cafe and what you hear, and, and like Avi said, highlighting what's going on in this uh, small ecosystem of Rhode Island. Great, thank you, Juan. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, so, so like I was saying, yeah, so one of the ways the areas where entrepreneurs of color have been um, uh, left out is in funding. So we'd like to hear uh, from our lovely panel of uh, entrepreneurs, what their challenges have been uh, or their experiences uh, trying to find funding for, for, for their businesses. Um, and so I'm going to start with uh, Ember Jackson. There we go. Yeah, so for me, I chose to start my business uh, without a loan. Um, for me, in my mind, I said, okay, I, I don't want to start off my business in debt. And so I consciously re refused to do that. So I was applying to grants and grants, but of course, applying for grants is extremely competitive. Um, and so I used my savings. My mom helped me out with the money as well. And so um, that was my experience. Um, also, I did attempt to do like a, a, a fundraiser at first. I did a Kickstarter because um, in my mind, like, oh, that's the more professional um, crowdfunding source to use compared to GoFundMe. And that did not go well because a lot of people are not familiar with Kickstarter. They're familiar with GoFundMe. So um, I, I did switch over later to GoFundMe. Even then, it's like that. Fundraising takes a lot of actual intentional effort that I don't have the energy for. And so I work, I operate in, uh, I own and operate alone. So I don't have a partner. I don't have a team. So it's just me. And so a lot of these things I just did not have the energy for. And so I've basically been funding my business through a recycling of revenue. Um, so it's a lot of things I want to do in my business. I just haven't been able to do it yet. Um, I'm also only one year into business, a little over a year, and um, it's been, it's gone extremely well for me, it's faster, much faster than I expected, so I'm, I'm very blessed in that way, but I'm still limited to what I can do based off of the funds that I have by simply uh, recycling revenue. Great, thank you so much, Amber. Uh, yeah, just a small reminder also, if you have any questions, any of the participants, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to send them through our chat and we, we're gonna try to answer them. And if you can say who you're specifically addressing your question to, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, the next per panelist on okay. my Yeah. So um, my husband and I, seven years ago when we started our food truck, um, we did get a loan through RI Commerce. I forgot what it was called before. I think it was economic develop it was called another um organization but um we did through a lot of legwork and um just trying to navigate the city to find out what was available to us because in terms of the black community and business there there wasn't any money no one was telling us there wasn't really an organization saying hey here's where you can go so just through a lot of research and talking to other business owners we um we found um our commerce and we did receive a loan from there to get the food truck started which was awesome um and now for my other business which was and so you know food service is food service but for my other business which is more my um speaking coaching and consulting business when i was putting on the conference and i would reach out for sponsorship or for investments into that program a lot of times people told me no because um, why are you just focusing this on black women or women of color? What about the other women? And I and so I, I did not receive funding from any um, major organization or even a small organization here. It was through um, personal um, connections I had 
through, um, I would say, friends and family, but no one would fund that because they did not understand why was I focusing on just women of color. Why not other women need this service too? And I had to always explain, there are other programs out, th out there for all women, but they're only gearing it towards white women and not black women. So I want to create that space. Mm -hmm. So because I had um, a, a, a niche or I just focused on black women, women of color, no one wanted to fund that. And I'm happy the tables are turning today. <laughs> so hopefully I could get some of that funding. <laughs> You're, um, Sterling, you were definitely a pioneer of your time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Carolyn, why don't you also okay. share, share with us since you're here? Yeah. So um, in my experience with Curly Girl, so, um, you know, my intention, you know, in becoming an entrepreneur, I envisioned that I would start so early in the game. You know, um, I took this class my senior year um, under Professor Hazeltine called Engine 900 and um, ended up acing it. And he was like, you know, you should really um, become like a CEO or a business owner one day. And I was like, no, like, I, I, I can't start my business. Like I have to go to law school. Like my mom put a lot of money into this degree. <laughs> um, so, um, Naturally, when I graduated from school, I worked for two years. I worked as a finance specialist for a nonprofit, and um, I was still making hair products, um, the very hair products that I started out of my dorm room, to now my family, my friends, my neighbors, and they loved it. So created a membership model, and then from there, I launched Curly Girl off of my own bootstrap funds. I started Curly Girl with truly $3,500. Um, so enough to entitize my company because I knew if I was going to start selling nationally, I did not want to, you know, get the blowback of somebody, you know, somebody could have like any type of allergy and be like, oh my God, I'm going to sue you for the little money you have. And, you know, enough to get the right supplies, um, the right inventory, and then enough to package and brand my own company. So all of Curly Girls funding has come from me only. But, you know, I've um, I think the challenge is, is that I didn't set out for that to go that way, you know? I had went through my respective networks from my college from within the Providence ecosystem, and every single time I would speak to folks, they would tell me, you know, you can just, you should raise through your family and friends network, and they would tell me raise like twenty-five to fifty thousand um, dollars. That's not not the life I live <laughs> like, you know like fifty thousand um, dollars is not something that would go into just a company and they don't know the RRI within the first 18 months it would go to a college education it would go into a house it has to go to something that's very tangible and you know yeah it just wasn't my just because of my financial situation is not something that was feasible and it's not feasible if you look at the data for other black folks in terms of net worth for so many other black people so I um I just bootstrapped and actually then cafe when I won the pitch competition is the first non-dilutive funding I've ever gotten <laughs> outside of my own um my own blood sweat and tears <laughs> so yeah Great, thank you so much. So, so now I imagine, yeah, with one with your type of business, you, I don't know, did you get a loan? Because, uh, at least from my experience, like your kind of your type of business, uh, it's 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 usually hard to get loans. Uh, what's been your your experience trying to raise money or uh, starting your business? Uh, I think I'm elder out of the panel, <laughs> so uh, uh, I started in 1994. Uh, as a graphic designer right out of high school. I was a young father, um, so just graduated high school and had my son, um, then my, what they call your baby's mama back then, who's now my wife. Uh, we've been together since high school. Uh, it's, it was a challenge. It was a challenge that whole friends and family, um, when I started working graphic design, um, I chose not to actually go to college uh, at the time uh, so I can raise my son, so I became what they call a hustler or an entrepreneur using my graphic design to um, provide services to the small businesses in the community. And that's how I started just going to different places that, that needed, that had their handwritten menus on the, on the window. And I'm like, so let me help them out. 
uh, and it's grown since then. And then I got into actually content promoting, uh, doing marketing and sponsorship packages for content promoting, uh, bringing Jay-Z here, which helped me develop sponsors, sponsor kits, sponsor package. And that's how I uh, raised a lot of my funds, even for my company. Um, so when I develop uh, sponsorship packets, um, I make sure there's enough for admin and there's enough to reinvest in the project and going forward in the company. So my practices were always to reinvest in what I was doing. So less need for a loan, uh, less money and, and um, basically just kept perpetuating um, and reinvesting. And then I got into intellectual property uh, by managing artists and learning about music publishing and software publishing and design. Uh, and so I'm always looking for passive and residual income. Um, and that's how my business generates its income. Uh, the balance sheet is, um, my wife calls me the colorful man in philanthropy and she's the black and white finance person. So she makes sure um, everything, the checks and balances are there. As far as uh, loans, I, I'm trying to uh, or, or invest investments. I'm always trying to figure out creative ways to create revenue streams uh, to use less loans. I've used SCORE. SCORE, I haven't used a loan from SCORE, but SCORE, I've been there on Saturdays. He mentioned it at the Providence Public Library. Um, and just learning how to use these resources in my network, but I've constantly reinvested. So I haven't taken technically any, any uh, loans as of yet, um, but I see things changing and so um like now my my investments are doing well my ip is doing well um and but the challenges i'm having now is expanding on it because of the lack of travel um i know we can do zoom but it's it's still not the same because i engage with people uh individual like one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face. um but i but i do have my son who graduated from college my wife just got her uh her master's this past june and we're looking to actually start a, a family joint venture. So, so, so I will be having a startup and looking at the more traditional uh, ways of starting a business. And, and so now that my wife has the MBA, she's looking at um, uh, per, commer, uh, purchasing commercial property. Uh, she's very interested in doing that. She's the handy woman in this house. She likes to take things apart and build things. I'm the computer person and the tech person. Um, but I do see it opening up. I, I'm, um, as far as opening up for minorities and opening up for black, black people in general, as far as funding opportunities. And what I, what my concern is, is that it's, it's a trend. I'm hoping it's not a trend. Um, I dealt with discrimination in the early nineties doing promotion. We couldn't even use hip hop in the commercial. And now you have hip hop and R and B on the radio station. So I dealt with a lot of, which was coming from black culture, discrimination and what I was doing with promoting music. And it's just happy to see it um uh, progress and i'm hoping this forward at this point forward that it progresses more for minorities to obtain funding great thank you so much uh, yeah so i i think that, that was a good transition to our next question that i think is uh important to a lot of people because often people don't understand why we need programs for uh, black people or, or entrepreneurs of color it's like you know why you know why just is that discrimination and all of that? I've been hearing those questions. So I'd like you to like uh, share with us, uh, our panelists, if you could share with us some of the challenges that you faced uh, that are specific to entrepreneurs of color. Because often you're alone, you're in the minority, you're doing this thing alone. And even the discrimination that you face, a lot of people don't know it until you share. Uh, so if you could yeah, share whatever you will feel comfortable sharing with us, like some of the challenges uh, that you've faced as an entrepreneur of color. And uh, I'd like to link that to like, if you, if you have any suggestion or solution of how the community or, or the ecosystem can be supportive uh, or in, in, in a way to address those, those challenges, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, let's start with Ember uh, again. Um, I think it's exactly what you said, knowing where to find these resources. Uh, many of us, as like myself, uh, academically, my background is, is in science, not business. So I simply don't know of certain resources. And um, there, of course, is not a handbook of how to start a business and pinpointing this is exactly what you do. You do this, and this, and this. And so a lot of us, we just don't know of resources. And so 
Um, I think even it's finding, like I said, funding, a lot of us, we rely on crowdfunding and helping our families and things like that. So if we are, there's a way for us to know more about the resources that are available to us, that would be helpful as well. Other than that, I think that's been like my main situation, just simply, I don't know what resources are here, unless someone tells me. They look online, that's something, even me, like from Chicago, I went to undergrad in Tennessee, I went to grad school in Alabama, and so these places that I lived, I had friends that own businesses all there, and a lot of them, they started their business off of grants from the state. And that's one thing I looked from, especially as bigger cities, their states provide startup grants, not loans, startup grants. And that was one thing that I looked for, and I was like, I don't, I can't find it. Um, and so I'm, I don't know if it's something that is not here through the state of Rhode Island, or I just haven't found it yet. So a lot of us just not knowing where to find these resources or what's even available. I would like to add that um, I'm sure the the buzzword that many of you have been hearing and um, listening to is systemic racism. And what does that have to do with this conversation? Um, I think systemically many, um, and I'll speak for this region of, of the world. So in Rhode Island, um, it's kind of set up where many, many of us, if you're a person of color within the state, um, you may not have the network or ever been taught to network. And that's a systemic thing. You, you're not taught to network. Or you are not coming from a place where you have, uh, um, I forgot the word they call it, forgive me, or I keep telling people, I just had a baby six months ago. I think my brain is still doing the way. Um, I think it's dispendable income. So, um, so you don't have the extra income to say, oh, I'm going to put this money um, aside to go and start a business. People look at you crazy. You better go and get your education if that's something I know from my family. They pushed, even though my father came here as an entrepreneur, but trying to survive as, a, survive as an immigrant and try to be an entrepreneur is hard at times when you have a lot of kids. And my parents had a lot of kids. And so they really push education, go and get your education, go and get your education. So if that, that, um, those resources, I think, or Curlin said, Caroline, excuse me, said that had to go to, that had to go to school. There's no extra money for your family. Like my family could not give us money to invest in any of my businesses because they just did not have it. So when you're going to get support, even to like some of these um, organizations, they're like, oh, go and get funding from your family. That doesn't exist. There's no funding in the family. We are in survival mode. We're trying to live, right? And um, unfortunately, that's many people's story. If you're a person of color, you're just trying to survive. Forget someone giving you a thousand. A thousand dollar loan can break a family. Like that means you might not be able to pay your rent. So when it came to that, my parents were very supportive with words. <laughs> Um, we love you. We think you can do it. Okay. Um, so there, there wasn't the, the financial backing, but also I think a struggle that I have faced is um, just people um, judging you harshly or not even trying to give you a chance. Um, because what, what do you know about this? Um, or we could just go with this other person that we know. I know, for instance, my husband, um, when he's on the food truck, my husband is the creator of all his recipes. He does everything. And we have white employees. And when people go to the truck to speak, to, um, to ask questions, they always direct it to the white employee. They don't see him as the owner. And so it's just the, the implicit bias, the systemic ways that we operate as a country and as a city a lot of times it's just people don't even see you that way. So forget about getting an opportunity. Don't, they don't even see you as a business owner. So just forget about that. So it's, it's real deep. And sometimes it's so hard um, as, a, as a Black woman to, to pinpoint, even though you know what's there. But when you speak about it, people say, well, maybe that's not the reason why. But you know that's the reason why they're not giving you an opportunity because you see other people are getting the opportunities. You see other people are being invited to stuff. And shout out to David, who always invites us to stuff, David. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's just hard. Sometimes people just don't take you serious or you're just not even a part of their, their sphere of thinking. Right. So off my soapbox right now. <laughs> That's what yeah, I think for me, um, I think there, there's, 
it's just like it's like such a spider web issue right like um if you touch one spot you're gonna eventually get stuck in another but for me i definitely think that there is a lack of mentorship and just um just overall community resources that are not given to folks of color you know i really do um near Amber's thoughts and the fact that, you know, I did not know a lot of the resources, but also because, you know, the resources, even when I did reach out to folks, they weren't pointed out to me. I was talking about this with my friend the other day, and I was like, you know, as a woman of color, you, you really become um, skillful in the art of asking for what you want. And most likely when you ask the person for what you want, they still will not give it to you. And I know that's just not the case for other white male entrepreneurs that I know. Like, I know the people that I'm thinking of, I will not say names, <laughs> in the ecosystem that did not have to show traction, which I have, show value proposition, which I have, work as hard as I had, uh, I had thus far, and um, were offered things. Like, when you're a white male, you are offered things. You don't need to ask for things. Um, you can just literally have an idea and people will offer community services. And I see that beyond anything being a bigger value than even the money, right? That's, that's the very essence of why the Rhode Island business competition, it's even though it's 50K, it's $40,000 in business advising and mentorship, and then you get the 10K. That's showing you that the, the essence of like building a build business is really your network um, and what your network is willing to invest in you. Um, and you know, it is, it is systemic, like it's just systemic, but also it's interpersonal. When you think about how people value black women in their lives on a daily level, it's for black women to constantly be serving them. <laughs> Very little will you ever ask a black woman, what do you need? How can I help you? Um, so that's where I see that happen. And then another thing is just, you know, the press pipeline in Rhode Island, the press pipeline in Rhode Island is very white and you guys only, um, you guys only feature black entrepreneurs during black history month or after a global pandemic and a racial uprising, like that needs to change. The only way that we can start to normalize or if, if there is an, is a nor normalization, but equitize um, black businesses in this ecosystem is that if you treat black businesses or if you feature black businesses, just like any other businesses, or in this case, to be very um, direct, white businesses. So. Those are the two things, I, you know, I think I've seen a lot of trend happen, happen in this ecosystem and buying in black businesses, but I want that to also follow suit in mentorship and advisory boards um, and real thought and um, sweat equity. I, I, I totally agree with all the panelists before me. Uh, I did all the effort. Um, it is. It is systemic. We talk about all the isms uh, that we face, uh, even within our own community. You have uh, folks who, when you talk about ageism and classism, you have some of the older uh, folks, when you talk about mentors, not even willing to mentor or saying they don't have the time. And some of them, sometimes they're worried about protecting their own. Um, that, that includes sharing resources. Um, so it gets a little selfish in, in some of our communities and and that and it's what they call the, the crabs in a barrel syndrome and we have that going on sometimes in, in our community that's kind of the reason why i've always been like the lone gun and some people look at Juan. i didn't even know you did that you know because i had to do it and find a way to do it myself um i'm just starting to reach out most of my mentors now uh, since my cousin mike has passed on uh, are black women um i have a angie and kuma melissa husband you know, saying those are two of my champions and everyone's like, one, they're women. What's that have to do with anything? They're good at what they do and women nurture. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm one of six children. Um, my, my brother was killed three years ago and then I have four other sisters, you know? So it's like, I've always been around women and they've always been nurturing. And, and I can echo, you know what I'm saying? That feel I'm, I'm not a black woman, but just being raised and around them, um, I understand uh, some of the challenges. And, and so 
I'm always trying to be that voice if I can, when I can. Um, and, and one of the things is when we talk about systems, I'm being honest, these systems weren't built for us. You know, these, these systems were not built for us. Um, so it's like when you talked about the equity, you know what I'm saying, in the system, it's like dismantling it and building a system of equity. You know what I'm saying? And looking for now that liberation. Uh, we always talk about the reciprocity. I kind of determine my value. You know what I'm saying? That's one of the things I like being about being an entrepreneur. I'm not worried about someone else determining my value. I'm doing all this on a high school education. I'm in college. I made sure my son went to school. My, my son got his bachelor's. My other son's in, in finishing his school. My, my wife got her master's. I understand education is important, but sometimes college and universities just wasn't my thing. You know, so I learned as I learned based on the careers I've taken. You know, what I'm saying taking those skill sets and adding it to my toolbox. And so that's why I focus on youth. When you're talking about building an equitable system, I don't like being reactive. Like this is being reactive. This I, I, to the Black Lives Matter, I love it and the attention, but it's reactive. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, what do we do to be proactive? And so my focus is on instilling you what that equity looks like, what that even playing looks like in entrepreneurship, in the way you educate yourself, in the way you finance yourself, and um, and just taking my lessons learned and passing them on. Uh, legacy is a big thing. So, but I love the opportunities, like I said, starting my family business, I'm starting from scratch. So I want to understand with mentors, financing, and, and all the different things that the younger people are going through to start their own businesses. And, and that's kind of where I say go. I said, if, if you're not ready to start your own business, work in the field, get some experience, you know what I'm saying? And then feel your way out. Um, not even just determined to go to school and then figure out that's not what I want to go to school for. Um, I try to encourage people to learn differently. You know what I'm saying, and imply it and implement it differently. And so, um, I know that's not uh, talking about as far as the, the problems, but I think it is deeper than what we see on the surface. Um, and I'm happy that it's brought to light. My thing is, I just don't want it to be trendy. You know what I'm saying? Continue to get those resources and build, and then putting those same systems in place to pay it forward uh, and teach the youth what we're learning today. Prosper, can I chime in really quick with something that Juan said? Yeah, uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I wanted to talk about network um, because, like I was saying before, and like Juan chipped in, uh, uh, um, said just now, we have to remember that many of us grow up not seeing people that look like us in business. And so we don't even have that network to even rely on. So when I attended Lincoln School for Girls, which was predominantly white, all of my classmates, every summer, they were working with a, a, a family member or a neighbor who owned a business. And so they're learning those soft skills, the hard skills of business, and can, can be prepared for that, where many young people in our community don't have that. And I know Juan and myself, we work really hard to be that representation. It's so much bigger than us. And, and, and why we have to focus on black businesses and the black community, because many of our young people are seeing it other than what they see on TV, basketball, rapper, Oprah, maybe, but they're not seeing that you can own a business yourself. You can be a startup and, and, and do really well. So network is important. And unfortunately in our, in our community, many of us don't have that. Wow, wow, this uh, this is very refreshing because uh, we've been talking a lot about like making sure that people who are affected by the problems are the ones providing the solutions. And I just to add one thing, Prosper. I'm sorry, but right now, you know, Black women are the fastest growing and largest demographic of entrepreneurs, right? So something happened in the ecosystem. I definitely think in a post Obama era where black children, at least of my generation and a few years older than me, saw that it is possible to do whatever you want in this country. So why are there still wealth disparities? Why are there still network disparities? The truth of in the essence is, is that because black people only represent 13% of the nation, no matter what, like no matter what the product or service is, you need, especially in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, you need greater community support. There should be no reason that if a black person comes to you and shows you their target market audience, their value prop, their team, their early financial models, that you're telling them that um, 
in my case, in the world full of Jeffree Stars, how will your business be profitable? First of all, Jeffree Star is in makeup. And secondly, Jeffree Star is a racist. He calls black women N-word B-words. There should be no, no reason when black women are, are pitching that you're stopping them midway and you're asking them, oh my God, black women only, um, they only wash their hair once a week, maybe twice a month. That's really dirty. Something that is so textbook colonial that this, this whole workshop could be focused on how problematic that was how violent that was, how, peop how white people have colonized countries over thinking that people of color are dirty. So I really like, you know, because this is a mixed crowd, that's why I really would like to urge that there really needs to be a shift, a cultural shift in how you value black folk and then by extension, black entrepreneurship and black founders. Thank yeah. you so much for all those interventions. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is, this is great. Um, I think uh, that we had just started to get to the meat of the conversation and think it's a, it's a sign that this is a, an ongoing conversation, like, uh, like many discussions uh, mentioned. Uh, it's not just going to be during this trendy Black Lives Matter. So I just want to thank all the panelists and everyone who was part of the conversation and thank you for the opportunity to moderate this this conversation, uh, I feel more hopeful than uh, I came in. So thank you very much.